and welcome to my channel. This is Dr. Micah Yu, also known as my autoimmune MD. If you're new here, welcome again. So there are so many signs for lupus and it can be very confusing as to who has lupus and who doesn't have lupus. But today, we're gonna be talking about 10 signs that you can see in lupus. First of all, we're gonna talk about labs first. That's number one. So what are the labs we look at in rheumatology that tell us that a patient can potentially have lupus? Well, I'm sure you guys have heard of the ANA or anti-nuclear antibody. That's one of the first things we look at in rheumatology. About 99% of patients with lupus will have a positive ANA, but about 1% of the population of lupus patients will have a negative ANA. So that gets tricky when you have a negative ANA and the patient can have potential lupus. And the ANA does come with a titer and it can tell you how strong the ANA is. The ANA at a minimum should be one to 80. That's what we look for in rheumatology and some doctors even say that's equivocal. And the ANA, I've seen it all the way up to one to 10,000. So ANA starts at around one to 40, which is considered negative, and then you get to one to 80 and it doubles from there. So it goes to one to 160, one to 320. And other labs we look at for lupus is the double-stranded DNA. The double-stranded DNA should be positive in lupus patients. Other labs included are the complement levels. The complements are part of your immune system and they get eaten up in lupus and they should go down. The complement labs include C3 and C4. And both of them can be low or just one of them. Another lab I look for is the anti-Smith. So the Smith antibody or anti-Smith should be positive in lupus patients as well. So those are just some of the basic labs I look for other rheumatologists look for when we are looking for lupus diagnosis. Now, of course, there are variations of this. Some patients will have a normal C3-C4. Some patients will have a negative Smith antibody. Some patients will even have a negative double-strand DNA. But there should be some clues that lupus is happening in the labs. It doesn't have to be all positive. And that's what makes lupus tricky is that the labs can vary from patient to patient. The second sign that rheumatologists look for in lupus patients are the blood cell counts. The blood cell counts include white blood cells, platelets, and hemoglobin. And in lupus patients, when the lupus is active, these labs can potentially go down. Not in everybody, but in a subset of the population of lupus patients, these labs will go down. And why is that? Well, that's because the immune system in lupus is attacking these blood cells to be destroyed so that these cell counts are falling down. So sometimes only one of the cell counts are low or maybe your white blood cell counts are low or two of the lines are low, your platelets and your white blood cells or all three and that's called pancytopenia. Your hemoglobin, your platelets and your white blood cell counts are low. And I've seen in my career, patients ending up in the hospital with extremely low blood cell counts where they need heavy duty medications just to get them better and high dose steroids. Eventually they do pretty well in my experience. Sign number three that you possibly can have lupus is oral and nasal ulcers. So some lupus patients will have ulcers in their mouth or even inside their nose. It's usually painless. And that's one of the signs we look for in lupus patients. And we usually require a photograph or we can see in person. That does help with the diagnosis. Sign number four that you could possibly have lupus is the classic malar rash or the butterfly rash. This is a red rash or a pink rash that goes across the face, especially on the cheeks and across the bridge of the nose, but it spares the nasal labial fold. So the folds here, it doesn't go past it. And that's a classic sign of lupus. If you go on Google images, you'll see this picture all over the page if you Google butterfly rash. And this rash can be confused with something called rosacea, which is another inflammatory condition that affects the skin. And that is treated with actually antibiotics, all right, or topical antibiotics. Whereas lupus is not treated with antibiotics, it's treated with lupus medications, which we'll go into in another video. And sign number five of lupus is alopecia, also known as hair loss. There are different forms of hair loss in lupus. You have the ones where you just have a distribution of hair loss all over the head, 
but there's no scar. I mean, there's no obvious clumps of hair loss that's not coming back. And then you have other versions of alopecia or hair loss that is more scarring alopecia where the hair doesn't go back and there's actually clumps there. Those are the couple of signs of hair loss in lupus patients. Sign number six of lupus is another form of rash called subcutaneous lupus rash or also a discoid lupus rash. And these rashes can be on the rest of the body. It can be on the arms, the legs, the back, the chest. Seal, the singer, the celebrity, has discoid lupus rash. And you can see on his face, there are scars on his face, and that's from discoid lupus. It's kind of distinct from what a mallow rash can look like. And sometimes these rashes can be quite difficult to diagnose and even distinguish from other diseases. So sometimes it does take a biopsy for diagnosis, or it takes a dermatologist to come take a look at the rash to make sure it is actually a lupus rash and not another rash from another disease. Sign number seven is arthritis. Joint pain, joint swelling. So of course you can have arthritis in so many different rheumatology autoimmune diseases. You have it in rheumatoid arthritis, or psoriatic arthritis, and so forth. But you can also see in lupus as well. And we gotta make sure that you don't have other diseases when you have an arthritis going on. Yes, it can certainly come from lupus, but you can also have it in rheumatoid arthritis. You can have psoriatic arthritis, and that, you can have that with lupus. So when you have rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus together, that is called rupus. And that is an actual word. I am not making that up. When I first heard of rupus, I thought that was something my bosses and my teachers were making up was an actual word, so rupus. But in lupus patients, you can get arthritis in your hands, your feet, your knees. But you do not have to have rheumatoid arthritis and your joints can swell up and you can have morning stiffness as well. So please be aware of that. Sign number eight, you could possibly have lupus is chest pain. Chest pain in lupus patients would typically be worsened with deep breaths. So if you have chest pain, I mean, you can have that from a heart attack for so many different reasons, or even if you, um, it could come from a musculoskeletal issue, okay? That's not lupus. But in lupus patients, chest pain is typically worsened with deep breaths. So if you take a deep breath in, it gets worse there. And I've seen it in a number of my patients before. Of course, you can have heart attack in lupus patients. Actually, lupus patients, like other other autoimmune disease will have a higher risk of heart attack because of all the inflammation going on. But in lupus patients, you can have this chest pain ongoing and it's distinct from other chest pains that you might experience. So going along with chest pain, there are other signs in this general area of the chest called effusion. So sometimes you can get fluid around your heart and that's called pericardial effusion or you can have pleural effusion fluid around the lungs and that can be seen in lupus as well and that's diagnosed on an ultrasound of the heart or even a CT scan or a chest x-ray and sometimes you can see that in lupus patients. So sign number nine of lupus is also known as neuropsychiatric lupus. I'm gonna clump all these symptoms together, okay? So neuropsychiatric lupus includes like brain fog, mood swings, delirium, hallucinations, memory issues. Probably one of the worst forms of neuropsychiatric lupus is going into a coma. So I remember when I was a, a fellow in rheumatology and this patient came in the hospital, no one was able to diagnose what was going on so they asked the rheumatology to come in and the patient's lupus labs were sky high and that's how we were able to diagnose a patient with neuropsychiatric lupus so it can come in many different shapes and forms and it can be very confusing because when you see a patient that's hallucinating or have delirium or even some memory loss and brain fog you don't think about lupus typically unless you're a rheumatologist okay we're finally here sign number 10 this is the last sign i'll be talking about and this is lupus nephritis, also known as lupus of the kidneys. So how do we diagnose lupus of the kidneys? Do we do ultrasound? Do we do imaging? What do we do? Well, you can detect lupus of the kidneys early on by doing blood work. Some allows we do is through the urine and we get the urine protein and urine creatinine. And the ratio should be less than 500 milligrams. If the ratio of urine protein over urine creatinine is more than 500 milligrams, then we start getting concerned in rheumatology that a patient could potentially have lupus. And if it's greater than one gram, 
then we definitely get more concerned. We look at the urinalysis to make sure there's no red blood cells or other things going on there that came out. And we look at the urine protein ratio. And that's one of the early signs of lupus of the kidneys. And we also look at the blood work. We look at the creatinine. If it keeps going up higher and higher, that means that the kidney could potentially injured or attacked in lupus. And when the lupus attacks the kidneys, this is very serious. And it depends on what level it is or what class it is. In lupus nephritis, there are six classes. One and two are more mild. Three, four, or five are more serious. And class number six means, you know, the kidneys are pretty much gone. Not, well, not gone, they're still there, but they're not gonna come back to function again. Usually when you're in class six, you're probably on dialysis by that time. Time. When we as rheumatologists see lupus nephritis class 3 or 4, we get very concerned and even 5 as well. And we give high dose steroids with heavy duty immunomodulating medications to help save the kidneys. So we've gone over 10 signs of lupus. Now, these are not the only signs of lupus, but I've covered a lot of them. Comment below what other things you want me to talk about with lupus. And if you have lupus, what manifestations of lupus do you have that I mentioned? Please subscribe to this channel. I would love your support. And please subscribe to my newsletter as well. I'll see you guys next time.